<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Today is June 19, 2018, 3.30 p.m. It's time for the Council on Aging meeting. The first order of business is the I Pledge Allegiance. So, right, let's, let's just leave it down. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I will take attendance today. Alice, present. Donna, present. Joe, present. B, <coughs> present. Janice, present. Joyce, present. And Pellegrino was absent today. Okay, new business. We have a speaker here today from the Delhi Fire Department who will be giving information on carbon monoxide and smoke detectors. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having us here. Um, for those of you who don't know myself, it's uh, Paul Konechner, captain with the Fire Department. I've been serving you for the past uh, 29 years um, and really enjoy where I work and who I serve. Uh, just a few minutes of your time to kind of remind ourselves the importance of uh, both carbon monoxide detection and smoke alarms. Um, if we take a look at smoke alarms, about 96% of homes in the United States have smoke alarms installed. However, about two-thirds of the residential fire deaths occur in these homes. That data implies that most people perish in residential fires, that the probability of a regular maintained smoke alarm is not there, or the probability that someone has disabled that smoke alarm because of either malfunction or a nuisance alarm each time that someone either uh, takes a shower or cooks. We can do some corrective measures to maybe downplay the amount of incidental activations. For instance, what we need to do is we need to make sure that everyone has a fire, um, fire alarm system installed in their property. And I can't say whether it's going to be what we call line voltage or a 110 volt system or battery operated system. The code is going to be different according to when your property was either built and or renovated, so we have to kind of reference what code was in place. But for instance, let's start off very simply that if we have a home that was built pre-1975 with no major modifications, we can still utilize a battery-operated smoke alarm system. There are two different types of manufactured uh, detectors. One um, is a ionization type and one is a photoelectric type. We'll go over what the differential is on those. We need to have a photoelectric type smoke detector in our properties. We need to maintain them. It really doesn't take a whole lot of effort for maintenance on a smoke alarm system, but once a month we want you to go and push that button in the center and that activates and tests each individual smoke alarm to ensure that it still operates. If it does not, we have to either replace the battery in itself or replace the entire detector. If the detector is greater than 10 years, that is its recommended lifespan, and we have to replace that entire detector, not just the battery. The new systems are going to be a sealed battery that will last for the entire 10-year lifespan of that smoke detector, that smoke alarm. So when that battery fails after 10 years, there's no option to even replace the battery to squeeze out just a few more years of that system that's already gone beyond its recommended lifespan to replace the entire detector with a brand new one so on and so forth as they fail. Um, the other uh, type of uh, detection which is actually commonly found in older systems is ionization. Now the ionization systems are not recommended for residential properties any longer uh, because they typically respond quicker to a fast flame type of fire and these are the ones that are notorious for nuisance alarms from just normal everyday cooking, bathing, a lot of steam coming out of the shower. So those nuisance alarms cause people to remove the batteries and I'll put it right back but you never do 
and I'll get it tomorrow. Then a week goes by, now a month goes by, and hopefully a tragic event doesn't take place in between. Excuse me. Turn that down. So that's why photoelectric detection is recommended throughout the state from the state fire marshal. And a photoelectric detector typically responds better to what we call a smoldering fire. You're not going to see a lot of open flame, but you will see a tremendous amount of smoke. Typically when people perish in fire, it's not the fire itself that actually takes their life. It's going to be the smoke and the carbon monoxide and all the other byproducts of combustion that will take the life. So that photoelectric technology is a better technology for a very smoky fire. Those are the ones that are probably going to take more lives than a fast moving fire. So that's why when we do a compliance inspection, we ensure that we have the right amount, the right locations, and the right type of technology. Um, if you have an older system that is battery-based, the fire department will come into your property for elder services, okay, for elders, and we will replace existing battery-operated smoke alarms, and we'll replace in locations that are necessary with a 10-year lithium battery that cannot be changed out. So again, when that battery dies away, that whole smoke alarm dies away. So for any elderly that live in the community, we do have a program that we can come into your home and, and replace battery-operated smoke alarms. Now again, the question is, well, where do I put smoke alarms? Yes? I have a two-story home, yep. but I also have a cellar but I have the fire alarms with, uh, on the first, this first floor and the second floor. Would it be mandatory for me to put one in the basement? There is, as a matter of fact, that's what I was going to speak on next, is again, location is difficult for me to tell you exactly where you would need it in your property until I look at the type of property, how many levels on the uh, property, and if there were any major modifications in that property that would cause new code to come in place. I see. So, with that being said, there are some basic rules that everyone has to follow. And pretty much what they are is you want to cover your stairways from your basement up through the top stairs, and you want to cover your bedrooms. So, in essence, what we look for basically is smoke detection at the bottom of the solar stairs and at every level of each floor. Okay, so your stairways are covered. Those are means of egress. You want early notification before smoke can fill that uh, egress area and block your way out, okay, during an emergent situation. That's where mine are. One is at the top of the stairs yep. and the other one's at the t bottom of the stairs. But I thought it would be mandatory to put one in the cellar in there those is. stairs. At the basement, at the base of each stairway, you're supposed yeah. to have one. That includes the yeah. cellar. Yep. Um, and again, there are going to be other parameters that come into place depending on what code was in place. For instance, if you have an older home that does not have any upgrades by code, then you probably will not need any smoke detection inside each bedroom. Oh. But outside of each bedroom would be necessary. Oh, yeah. If you, if you now renovate and you come up to current code, you will have not only those stairways covered, but you also have inside each bedroom. I'll see where it is, is my three bedrooms are right, and it's right in the middle of that in the stairway. Okay, so you're probably covered by that one detector out in that area. And they work, because sometimes when they're cooking downstairs, we well, get again, the smoke and they go check off. Check them once a month, make sure that they do operate, make sure that they are photoelectric. Cooking incidents will be reduced if you change over to a photoelectric technology. It's not gonna eliminate everything, yeah. okay? But it's less likely to trigger a nuisance alarm if you have photoelectric technology. And again, the more times it's triggered, the more times that battery comes out of it, or it's, the whole thing's taken down, removed, and it's not put back. It's just, yeah. we, see, wait, it, we see it quite often. What scares me is my sense on oxygen. Okay and that we have to be very careful sure in my do. house because he is on oxygen. But again, monitoring is even more of importance in that type of atmosphere. Yeah. So um, if your alarms do sound, okay, 
please treat it as a true emergency. We do. Every alarm is a true emergency until we show up and we tell you it's not an emergency. Okay? I see. That could just be a failure of a single detector right. and it triggered the entire system. But please, every single alarm it. should be treated as they a true about emergency. That in the house with him with okay. the oxygen. Yeah, and just do. egress the building. When that alarm sounds, egress the building, 911 from outside of the building, and make sure you have a head count of who was in the building for family or friends. Make sure they're all out of the building. Uh, okay. Thank God. Any questions on smoke alarms? I have a question. Um, we now have to have a regular smoke detector and a carbon monoxide detector. I'm going to be talking about carbon monoxide in a minute. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to cover the smoke alarms first. Okay. Yes, but yes, you do. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't know about the double. The so what happens double. when you have an apartment house? I'm, I'm living in there and I have two apartments. Apartment houses, um, there are several different codes that may come into place depending on how many apartments there are in that building. Um, so we would have to really meet with you, look at the building, find out how many residents there are in the building, and apply the code that is needed for that facility. So I, I wish I could give you a, a steadfast answer, but I owned an there's different areas of the code that would apply. Okay, and I would not want to give you something that is incorrect or speculation. Okay. I you can give a, us a call. I owned an apartment in Webster. Yep. I had to put installed seven smoke detectors in through the whole the hallways, how, the cellar, right. how many the apartments? front hallway. Seven of them I had to put in. How many how many apartments do you have in the building? Two. Okay. But I had yeah. to put in seven Typic detectors. Typically in apartments the again the hallways are of um, importance. You want it early notification before those egress points become charged with smoke and products of combustion, so. So you would come and do a compliance and tell us, tell like, you come to my house and you would tell me exactly where those smoke de detectors and carbon dioxide detectors Our would have to go? Our practice usually is on sale or transfer to go do a compliance inspection, but I'm sure if you give us a call, we can do a uh, complimentary walkthrough and give you some advice you know, exactly where they should be put yeah. and... Yeah, Okay? Okay, thank you. All right, um, anything else for smoke alarms? Go ahead. Yeah, your, chief, he, your chief said he was going to come to my house and do, check my house? Okay. But he never took my name. I will take your name before I leave. <laughs> <laughs> Unless he knew me, I don't know. I will take your yeah. name and address before I leave. Okay. I promise you. <laughs> Carbon monoxide is um, kind of a challenging thing because it is a invisible gas, there is no odor, you cannot taste it, you cannot smell it. It could be present in this room and we would have no idea that there is an emergent situation. Carbon monoxide gas is a byproduct of burnt fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, what are they? cordwood, wood pellet stoves, natural gas, propane gas, gasoline, diesel fuel. So there's a multitude of different types of fuels that could be burned that will produce carbon monoxide. In, question? Or you no, just, I okay. just got to carbon, <laughs> carbon monoxide is a gas that is almost the same weight as the ambient air. So, for instance, if you have a leak in a propane tank, that gas is heavier than air, so it will sink. Natural gas is the opposite. It's a gas that is lighter than air, so it will rise and dissipate. Carbon monoxide is about the same weight as ambient air, so it will naturally flow through a property with the air currents that flow through the property. So. Smoke alarms are always mounted up high because smoke will rise with the uh, thermal columns that are produced from a fire. Carbon monoxide, when it's produced from, let's say that you have a clogged vent pipe on a fireplace or a wood pellet stove, you could have a malfunctioning oil burner, you could have a garage underneath your home. Winter time, you go to start your car, let it warm up, good idea. No, you're filling your home with carbon monoxide. 
So that carbon monoxide is not going to rise or fall. It's going to go wherever those natural air currents in the property take it. So smoke detectors are always up high because the thermal columns will bring that smoke up high first. Carbon monoxide detectors can be up high on ceiling, mounted on a wall, or plugged into a 110 volt receptacle that is uh, 18 inches off the floor. Doesn't matter where they're put as far as height wise. However, every home should have a number of um, detectors located. And again, we'll start off in the basement. Every home should have a carbon monoxide detector in the basement. Just in case if that oil burner does malfunction, it will notify you. Or if you have a car that is able to drive into a garage underneath or mm -hmm. attached and some carbon monoxide does enter into the basement, it will notify you. One question. Yeah. Where would you put it? Because I have stairs going down, but it's open. If you understand what I mean, the front room, yeah, the typically, room, rest of it are all open. Typically, smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms will be mounted on the ceiling in proximity to the bottom of the cellar stairs. So what we tell people is when okay. you get to the bottom of these cellar stairs, look up, yeah. mount them okay. right above you in that particular area. So I'll get one and put one in. In I'd that particular area. safe than sorry. Exactly. Yep. For minimal cost, um, you know, peace of mind. So... Now you come up to your first floor, okay? Some homes have bedrooms on the first floor. Some do not, okay? So if there are no bedrooms on the first floor, you need to have carbon monoxide protection somewhere, but it doesn't indicate where. You can put it anywhere. If you do have a bedroom on the first floor, carbon monoxide detection has to be within 10 feet of that bedroom door. Second floor, if you have a second floor, typically there's going to be two, three, some larger homes have four bedrooms up on the second floor, and again, within 10 feet of that bedroom door. However, if you get into a, um, say, a raised ranch type of property or colonial, if you put one carbon monoxide detector in the hallway, you usually can measure 10 feet each way, and it's within that 10-foot offset from a bedroom door. So carbon monoxide is just as important mm -hmm. to um, have detection as it is for smoke alarms. I have a combination. I, you combination. Can, yeah, I was going to talk about the combination I detector. Some people detectors. like having a combination detector that does both carbon monoxide and smoke for aesthetic reasons because there's only one detector instead of having multiple detectors walk down the hallway. So for aesthetic reasons, it is permissible. However, a carbon monoxide detector's lifespan is shorter than a smoke alarm. Okay you get seven years of life from a carbon monoxide detector. So if you do buy that combination detector, you truly only have a 10, uh, I'm sorry, a seven year smoke alarm because you're gonna take the whole thing down, throw it away, replace it when that carbon monoxide lifespan runs out. Uh, you understand that? I understand. Okay, so, and a lot of people do that. It's common practice and there's nothing wrong with it, but just keep in mind that you don't really now have a 10-year detector for smoke, it's pretty much going to be married to that carbon monoxide alarm, which is seven years. Again, um, if that carbon monoxide alarm sounds, treat it as a true emergency, egress the property, call 911, we will come in and we will tell you if it is an emergency and we'll correct it, or if it's not an emergency, maybe just a failed detector. Um, I don't believe the chief's program for smoke alarm replacement includes carbon monoxide replacement, but give him a call, sweet talk, and we can see what we can do. <laughs> Any questions on carbon monoxide detection? That's interesting. And I really wish that it was clear cut as far as what you need and how many you need, but it really varies according to what type of property you have and the age of the property. One other thing that I did want to talk about briefly is um, I think most people have some knowledge on the um, file of life. And it is a, a well-received program, especially for elders that need EMS, the ambulance service that we provide from the firehouse. If we come into your property, and you are not able to communicate and speak to us as far as what you have for medical history, 
what you have for contact numbers to family members, so on and so forth. These files are really simple and extraordinary as far as giving us all of the needed information in order to really treat your ailment, transport you to a local emergency room, and also make contact with loved ones to let them know where you are and what's happened. So just on a two-side paper tucked into the file of life that has a magnet on the back side, usually we tell people, keep these things posted right on the um, front door of your refrigerator. Move the grandkids around, <laughs> put this on you know, front, and we'll know where it is. But it gives medical conditions, type of allergies, and it gives um, some medical data, emergency contacts, so on and so forth. So we have these at the uh, firehouse. If anyone really needs to have a um, file of life posted, I brought, I believe, 10 or 12 of these. I'll leave them with you. Mm -hmm. Everyone can take one. If there's a couple extra, you can hand them out. But again, uh, let everyone know that we do have these in stock at the firehouse, and um, anyone that is senior to me can come down and you know pick one up and post it on a door and hopefully you know it's it's never used that's good I have to go see a client after I we leave here and they need one because the one they have is all filled out <laughs> yeah again these are very important to maintain again that smoke detector is supposed to maintain these here go out of date very quickly so if you do fill them out put a date when it was filled out so we can clearly see if it was filled out two years ago. It may not be completely accurate, but we'll get a sense of, of what's going on. Question? Yeah. I actually used mine in uh, December. I passed out and the EMTs came over and I was just coming out of it and they said, well, what medications are you on? I'm going, yeah. Yeah, you you're know. not thinking clearly. So I just pointed to the refrigerator and they went over and got it. Again, this is um, something that should be maintained and updated periodically, yeah. only because your medications change periodically. And if it's not the type of medication, the dosage may change. But more important for us, when the paramedics come in, they're looking for what type of medications you are taking. And even if you cannot communicate to us and tell us what is wrong, we can kind of go by what type of medications are prescribed to you, and that points us into a direction of what type of affliction you have you know, medically, so we can decipher just from what you are prescribed. Yeah, that was very handy, so, very, really helped me out a lot. Because, good. you know, when you're going through something like that, you, you know, you can't think straight, you know? And For uh, us, it becomes, you know, this is our job, and we understand what needs to get done. For you, it's out of the ordinary, and you're not thinking clearly. You're probably thinking the worst is about to happen, but you know, for us, this is this is helping us do our job and protecting you. So, it's really a good thing. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah, the, this is an interesting question. What about that life that, no, that do not resuscitate that paper? What yeah. do you get? The, you can have that home at home. The uh, file of life this no, year? No, no, do not resuscitate if you come. Oh, your DNR. Um, if you do not want the paramedics to do CPR, give you medications, use your defibrillator, then you'll have to work through your um, primary care physician to get a, uh, a form signed indicating <laughs> that I don't want this. So if you have your DNR with you, we will abide by your wishes. However, if you are away from home and you do not have your DNR with you or some other comfort care measures, we have to apply all life-saving measures because we do not have that document indicating your wishes. Well, uh, mine on my what Mostly you'll find them in refrigerators or medicine see. cabinets or something like mm -hmm. that, yeah. I was in the house one time and you people came and he was really bad, that man, and you asked for something and they didn't have it and you were really upset. But to, to not resuscitate or something? Well, I think he was pretty it, bad. It's, it's a matter of. So families, I want to make sure I have it. Family's wishes are 
are spoken when we arrive. But until we have that legal document in hand, we cannot just go on family wishes. We have to have that legal document. Um, and there's no gray area with that. It's, it's, I understand that the family knows that there's a DNR in place, but if we don't have it in hand, it's, it's really difficult to amend. So we have to go by what we're trained to do. So, okay? Yep. Oh, sure, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your support and thank you for the invite. Thank All you. right, well, okay. you. I'm glad you came. Thanks for stopping thank by. Very informative. Yeah, thank you. You're as nice as your mother was. I knew your mother. I, don't, I got Mom two at home already. I got she two at home. Uh, maybe I should take it for a good So don't forget, take my name. I worked with her. You know. I, have a, I have one on my refrigerator. Well, if you need any more, I'll just leave these here. Yep, we can take them downstairs. And again, let, uh, I think she has some too. Oh my God, if I had to do recent surgeries, I'd fill the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Very good. If I had to put recent surgeries, I'd fill the whole page <laughs> and then some. Okay, we don't have any old business, I don't think. To Take discuss. my name. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to change here. Nope, no, I didn't forget that. <laughs> okay. Okay, minutes. Uh, Donna, would you like to read the minutes? Sure. <laughs> sure you would. <laughs> the regularly scheduled meeting of the Dudley Council on Aging was called to order at 3.30 p.m., on Tuesday, May 15, 2018, in room 321A of the Dudley Municipal Complex by Vice Chair Donna, members present were Josephine, Beatrice, Janice, Joyce. The meeting was opened by the Pledge of Allegiance. The minutes of the April 6, 2018 were read. Janice moved to approve the minutes as read, seconded by Josephine. Vote was unanimous. Coordinators report. Janice read the coordinator's report of May 2018. Tri-Valley lunch program on Mondays and Fridays at 11.30. Call Inga to reserve. Chair yoga on Mondays and Fridays, 10.30 to 11.30, $2 per class. Monday movie matinee at 12.30 p.m. Dudley Senior Women's Needle Group meets Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. 13 card pitch meets on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. One-to-one -one computer class with Joyce Godero on two Thursdays at 11 a.m. by appointment. Cribbage Thursday at 1 p.m. Bingo Fridays at 12.30 p.m. And I believe we need bingo players. Past events. April 19th, Memory Cafe, 35 people attended. April 23rd, a mini garden workshop by Tina Bemis of Bemis Farms, 7 people attended. April 27th was Jimmy D's Italian lunch. On May 2nd, a group traveled to Rhode Island to visit Wicked Tulips. May 11th there was a Mother's Day tea which was held and a presentation of the history of teapots was given. Oh, Upcoming events. On May 17th, 3 to 5, Common Ground Memory Cafe. It's, it's scheduled every Thursday, every third Thursday of the month, featuring Dana Lewis. Music starts promptly at 3 p.m. May 25th at noon, Jimmy D's Italian Lunch. Tickets are $5 per person and available at COA office or Alice. Tina's Bemis Workshop on Monday at 9 a.m., $15 per workshop. RSVP, sign up early. June 25th, the traffic stopping pot on July 9th, the culinary herb bowl on July 30th, a topiary turtle, September 17th, autumn art, October 22nd, pumpkin project, December 17th, boxwood tree, July 12th, 6 to 8 p.m., pastel workshop with Greg McKasick. Monet's Magic Wonderless Lilies. Call by June 29th to reserve your seat. It's a popular worship workshop and it's free to any adults. Beatrice moved to accept the coordinator's, re coordinator's report, seconded by Joyce. <coughs> Excuse me. 
new business smoke detector presentation joyce stopped at the fire station and a couple of the firefighters will be coming in on july on june 19th at 3 30 to talk about the smoke and carbon monoxide detectors bingo beatrice would like to see bingo back on schedule beatrice will talk to rhoda and betty richard volunteer to call Margaret Boussier on vacation for three weeks starting Thursday will need someone to check the phone for messages and return calls. I Ma have a caller. I don't mean to interrupt you, but we do have a new caller. Okay. May 31st from 10 to 2 p.m., a health and wellness fair at Tri-Valley Nutrition, Fire and P Police Department presentations, and a matter of balance are scheduled. The next meeting is June 19th at 3.30 p.m., as there was no further business to come from before the council, Janice moved to adjourn at 3.46 p.m., seconded by Beatrice. The vote was unanimous. Submitted by Carol Savard, COA Secretary. Will someone make a motion to accept the minutes as read? I'll accept the thing that says read. Second? I second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the council. No, the next, okay, the council on. Uh, let me see. Coordinators report. Uh, Joyce, would you like to read that? The COA report, June 2018. The Common Ground Memory Cafe, May 17th, was well attended. We had some special guests from Sturbridge who came to gather ideas for their own newly formed memory cafe. We listened and sang along to some 60s, 70s oldies with Dana Lewis. The June 21st memory cafe will feature Ro Roger Tinknell for a 50s and 60s oldies sing-along. Roger is a multi-musical, instrument-talented individual. Come join us for this free program sponsored by the MCOA, Refreshments Provided. We will be hosting guests from Spencer Senior Center 621 who will be checking us out for future plans of their own. There are now 84 memory cafes here in Massachusetts and steadily growing. We are proud to be one of them here in Dudley. Jimmy D's Italian Lunch was held May 25th where are all of our friends who used to lunch with us? Jimmy will be taking the summer off. Perhaps we'll pick up again in September. On June 14th, the Dudley Senior Center slash COA hosted our annual volunteer lunch. 24 precious volunteers gather for a most delicious barbecue picnic style lunch from Good Stuff Smokehouse in Blackstone. A huge thank you to all of our wonderful volunteers for all you do around here. Coming this week, June 21st, 3 to 5 p.m., Common Ground Memory Cafe at the Dudley Senior Center. Free to caregivers, family, friends, loved ones, and especially individuals affected by memory issues due to Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, stroke, PTSD, brain injury or other brain challenges. Come and enjoy a fun date together with friends complete with a light meal and refreshments. We have live music and art programs. The Memory Cafe is meant to be a great time out together, sharing laughter and non-judgmental fun. For more information or to RSVP, please call Margaret at 508-949 8015 extension 3. Walk and friends are always welcome. The Memory Cafe is scheduled for every third Thursday of the month, 3 to 5 p.m. The June 21st Memory Cafe is featuring Roger Tinknell. If you are a Beatles, Era, Roy Orbison, or Beach Boys fan, this program is for you. The Memory Cafe is sponsored by a grant for MCOA through the Office of Elder Affairs. Coming very soon, Tina Bemis from Bemis Farms will be here June 25th at 9 a.m. to present a traffic stopping
pot workshop. Cost is $15 per person. There's still room for a few more participants. Come join us. Please call by 622 if you're interested. Future Bemis Farm Workshop dates July 9th, Culinary Herb Bowl, July 30th, Topiary Turtle, September 17th, Autumn Art, October 22nd, Cold Lunch, December 17th, Boxwood Tree. All are scheduled on Mondays at 9 a.m. and are $15 per workshop. RSVP, please to Margaret at least one week before workshop in order to plan for craft supplies. July 12, 6 to 8 p.m. Senior Center. Please read, this is an excellent workshop not to be missed. July 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. Thursday evening, Greg Metchek, a pastel arts workshop. Monet's Magic, pastel paint Monet's Wonderful, Wondrous Lilies. Please call by July 6th to reserve your seat as space is limited, for this is a very popular workshop. Greg brings all the professional supplies needed to create your own pastel masterpiece. This program is supported by a grant from the Dudley Cultural Council, a local agency supported by the Massachusetts Cultural Arts Council, a state agency. This free program is for any adult, any school level who is interested. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Will anyone, uh, someone make a mo motion to accept the COA report as read? Make a motion to accept the report as read. I second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. In other business, uh, I want to mention that this year the Sheriff's Annual Senior Picnic for Seniors is on Saturday, August 18th at the SAC Park on Lake Street in Shrewsbury from 11 to 3 p.m. Uh, it's a fun full day with complimentary lunch, raffles, and bingo in honor of our seniors. For more information, contact Donna Ostigi at Dostigi at Worcester County Sheriff's org office. So uh, that's a fun time for everyone. I've been there before and it's uh, really a good day spent. Uh, and uh, other business, Margaret had a few other th things to mention here, ongoing um, things that are happening at the Senior Center. Uh, Jan, do you want to read that? Yeah. Um, this is the summer regular scheduled program. Tri-Valley lunch program is on Mondays and Fridays at 11.30 a.m. Please call Inga at 508-949-9081 to reserve a meal. Meals must be reserved at least 48 hours in advance. A $3 donation for the meal is requested. Chair Yoga with Joanna La Liberty is on Mondays and Fridays, 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. Class is $2. This is a great way to improve your range of motion while implementing relaxation techniques to calm and balance. Yoga has been well attended on Mondays and Fridays. Monday movie matinee is at 12.30 p.m. Come join us. About four of us regularly attend the matinee. We're featuring the latest movies streamed from Amazon right to our TV. 13 Car Pitch meets Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Dudley Senior Women's Needleworks Group meets Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 1 p.m. And one-to-one -one computer class with Joyce Cordero Thursdays at 11 a.m. by at 11 a.m. by appointment. Call Senior Center if you're interested. Quib Quibbits players Thursdays at 1 p.m. About four or five people regularly play cribbage. New players are always welcome. Bingo is at, on Fridays at 12.30 p.m. Okay, thank you, Jan. Uh, is there any other business anyone would like to speak about? Okay. You know, we were told quite a while ago that all the stuff of the bingo is in what's the still. It's in their circles. 
someone has to write a letter to the selectmen and ask them what they intend to do with it and if they are willing to donate it or sell it to us at a very reasonable price. But I have not the authority to write that Is that the, uh, the Webster Senior Center? It's the Webster. They're it's old, a selectman. You they're have used to write to them. Uh, board and... Yeah, you have to write to them and ask them. You know you've been informed that the bingo things that they have that was on School Street is now in storage and ask them what they had planned to do with them, if they are available to be bought or to be given away to another organization. Okay. Maybe you and I can get together and... I don't know how to write good letters. I don't know. Well, that's why I said we'll get together and... I'm please. terrible. <laughs> I'm the worst letter writer in the that's world. That's why I need help, too. Who need these people <laughs> here? Yeah. yeah. This lady here, she's the smart one. <laughs> And they're, they, they're all smart. They are looking for more bingo players on Friday, correct? We are definitely. It, it started we are back definitely up and we are looking, looking for more players. Players to come back. But I think why they don't come is because of the fact that we only have the papers to show what we're playing. And mm -hmm. a lot of people miss whatever the number was. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for a board or something that they can look up and say, oh, yeah. gee, I missed that number. Yeah. Yeah. I'm awful. I'm, I've been yelling about bingo for a long time. But we are back on track with the bingo anyway, that well, it is back on. Since we have a new call. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's good news. Uh, yes. Joe said he was very good. I thought he was very good. Carolyn said he called a little bit too fast. For yeah. Carolyn, well, for Carol he was. He's got to get adjusted, you know. So I mean. well, wasn't too fast. To everybody else he called fine, except to Carolyn. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. I mean, okay. I can't. Anything say. else? No, that's about all I have to say. Okay, the next meeting of Which the Council on Aging me, little. <laughs> will be September 18, 2018, at 3.30 p.m. in the Dudley Municipal Complex, Veterans Memorial Hall, room 321A. Will someone make a motion to accept this adjournment? I make a motion that we adjourn I the second. meeting. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> We're not having any meeting in July? No, no. not for the summer. Okay, August 18th, I will not be able to attend. It is not two. It's not until September. I, August, August. Um, September. Oh, September. September, that's the oh, sheriff's, okay. that's the sheriff's I picnic. Five doctor's appointments in August. That was the, okay. yeah, so well, we won't be back till September. Get it? Hey, I hope by then I'm still living <laughs> I okay. hope we all are. <laughs> get outside or we're left there. I get outside. I have the call up there. I get outside. Didn't even I go out? No, we already did. Such a scene of grass. So. Oh, there.